Turn to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look here in the Scripture. It's, it's so odd that he's up here talking about um, uh, the blind this morning and the deaf because that's what I'm going to preach about this morning. Uh, a couple of blind men in the Bible. Matthew chapter 20. And I want you to look, please, if you will, in Matthew chapter 20 and verse number uh, 29. Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 29. 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. As you know, sometimes thousands, four and five thousand people at a time would follow Jesus when he'd go here and there. Now watch what happened. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them. The people didn't like it because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Now I want to preach this morning on the subject, the cry that stopped the Savior. The cry that stopped the Savior. In this scripture this morning, we are well into the ministry of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably a good halfway or maybe two-thirds of the way through his three and a half years of public ministry. Think about it. He is on just a short mission here in this world. God in the flesh walking among men only three and a half years to get done everything that he was going to get done and, and die on the cross and pay for sin. A multitude is thronging him everywhere he goes. So the Lord's going this way, and they're literally, it doesn't say how many, but we may be safe to say thousands possibly were with him during that day. Now remember, no, no microphones, no TV cameras, no, 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 no automobiles, no places of where you could get down and get an aerial view, no planes overhead, just thousands of people walking through the streets of a city. Here's Jesus, and all these people are around him. I can imagine everybody wanting to get close enough just to touch him. I can imagine everybody, there he is, there he is. You know what my, my cousin said? They were just walking right beside him. I'd love to, I just want to see who he is. I just want to see what he is. And no doubt somebody was saying, Jesus, what do you think about this? Jesus, how about that? Jesus, is this wrong? Jesus, is that... I mean, thronging him and pushing him constantly. Can you imagine? The very Son of God. And he was walking, going to this town. But these two men gave the cry that stopped the Savior. I'm interested in that. I mean, if two guys can cry out and he can stop what he's doing and turn around and heal them, then I'd want to know how they did that, wouldn't you? I'd want to be able to make a cry that stopped the Savior. Well, I'm telling you this morning, uh, the Savior takes time. Isn't, it, isn't that just like Jesus? Of all the things he's got to do, I mean, he's dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the world at that time. He's revealing God. To them. And yet the Savior, he stops to help two poor, insignificant blind men that nobody else cared about. That's Jesus right there. That's the Lord right there. Them guys had no money. They didn't come with a big offering. They didn't come and say, now Jesus, uh, uh, the Pope and the other one want to meet with you today and well, you need to stop and talk to him and the religious leaders from Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and the, you know they give a lot of money over here and we need to help them out and they give to this foundation and that foundation so maybe you ought to stop and talk to them. No, it wasn't none of no politics, nothing. Two blind men that had nothing to offer stopped 
the Savior. I'm telling you this morning, that's the way the Lord did. And so I want us to look at it this morning. And let's divide that little, little story up this morning and think about it. That's much like me and you. I'm glad one night when I was 18 years old, I fell on my face at Nebo Baptist Church 20 miles that way, and my cry stopped the Savior. I don't know what all he was doing that night. I mean, he was running universes and, and healing people over yonder and doing this in other parts of the world, and my cry, little Danny Castle, stopped the Savior, and he heard me. Amen? You know, that's what I like about Jesus. There's no such thing as him being a respected person and making leeway for big shots. A uh, little girl that sang up here a minute ago is just as important to him as uh, Father Abraham was, brother, or anybody else. And you here this morning may need to have a cry that stops the Savior. First of all, let's look at it carefully this morning. It was a cry of personal concern. Them old guys, uh, you know what? Before you can get help from the Lord, you've got to get personally concerned about yourself and the situation you're in. You'll never get the Savior's attention as long as you're just putting it off and blaming the other people for what's wrong with you and, and blaming this person and that person and society and your wife and kids and everything else. Uh, they got personally concerned. It was a problem that had plagued them, no doubt, their entire lives. The Bible don't say, but... More than likely, they were blind from birth. And these men had, had always, they, had, uh, uh, they uh, uh, had never seen anything. That reminds me of the conversion of George Whitfield. You've heard me mention the great preacher, George Whitfield. And if you went to the right kind of school, you know who George Whitfield is. If you went to the wrong kind, you've never heard of him. Uh, they, they call him public. And uh, George Whitfield was under deep, conviction of sin when he was 16 years of age. He was wicked, and he tried to get himself right with God. He prayed. He went around praying all the time, but he was reciting prayers. There's a difference between reciting prayers and praying. Uh, reciting prayers is a waste of breath. But he, he'd go around and he'd say, uh, uh, Father, help me. Oh, Father, uh, Mother of Mary, uh, remember us now in the hour of our death, you know, and stuff like that. And it got him nowhere. He even fasted a couple of times a week uh, in order uh, to try to get God's favor on his life. And nothing happened. He found no peace. And he met a man by the name of Charles Wesley, uh, the great brother of John Wesley, the preacher. And Charles Wesley gave George Whitfield a book, and it was told about how to be born again. How to be born again. And he read it, and he got it straight. And George Whitfield got down, and he said, Lord, I, I, he's like that old country guy that got out there the other day, and he said, Lord, would you born me again? That's what he said. And the Lord did. And George Whitfield become a preacher. And George Whitfield, yeah, you'll never guess what his favorite text was, John 3, you must be born again. They said, Brother Jim, he preached it over a thousand times. Everywhere he'd go, you must be born again. You must be born again. And somebody said, why do you preach on that all the time? He said, because you must be born again. I'm telling you this morning, George Whitfield got born again. All of his fasting didn't work. All of his, quote, prayers didn't work. But he finally got personally concerned about himself, and the Lord heard him and helped him. Let me tell you how you can get help from the Lord this morning. Forget about everybody else. Forget about blaming your society. Forget about blaming the way you was raised. Forget about blaming your mom and daddy and say, Dear Lord, I'm blind. Would you help me? It was a cry of personal concern. But I want to say secondly this morning, it was a cry of positive faith. Positive faith. The Bible said when they heard that Jesus passed by. Now imagine, these guys have never seen anything. They couldn't go nowhere. They couldn't work a job. They were sitting by the highway side. Probably had a sign up. You know, help. Uh, homeless. Need food. Need help. I don't know. But they were sitting by the side. They heard that Jesus passed by. And when they heard that, they believed it. It was a prayer, a call of positive faith. You know what? One of them said, you know what? I believe in him. And the other said, I do too. You must believe in him. The Bible said, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently 
seek Him. The only way you're going to get help from God, you've got to believe He is and that He will help you. It's not enough to believe He can. You must believe He will. And, buddy, they believed He would. Can you imagine these two guys sitting on there and they said, Lord Jesus, help me. Their cry showed their faith. Their cry showed their faith. Now, they might have been a bunch of other blind men sitting there. I don't know. I mean, they might have had a whole colony of them. They might have been 10 or 15 of them sitting down there, but only two got healed. And you know why? Because they're the only ones that called on him in positive faith. The night you got saved, they might have been 20 sinners in the church, but you're the one that called on him. See, the one that called People say, well, why does God save one person, not another? It ain't because he loves one more than the other. And it sure ain't because he chose one above another. He said, brother, it's because they called. They wanted help. They wanted help. And I'm telling you this morning, anybody in this building can get help from Jesus today, right here today. He's here. And all you got to do is believe he's here and he'll help you. It was a cry of positive faith. I'll never forget hearing about this old man. And they called him Old Man Klein. His last name was Klein. And he'd call him old man Klein. He's mean as a snake. And he'd go around the town walking. And he's walking down the road one day. And he said he'd come walking down the road. And there's a little country church. Had the windows open and the people was in there singing. And old Mr. Klein, he's walking down the road just like old Scrooge, like that. And there's in there and them people was singing, Jesus died for all mankind. Jesus died for all mankind. And old Klein, he couldn't hear good. And he thought they said, Jesus died for old man Klein. And when he heard that, I, I believe the Lord just let him hear that, don't you? And he said, you know what? Them people's in there singing about me. They said Jesus died for old man Klein. And he went in there and heard the gospel and got born again and got saved by the grace of God. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth tonight, brother. Well, this morning, Jesus did die for old man Klein. And he died for old man Danny too, amen. And old man Jeremy, and old man Jim, and old man Jimmy, and old woman Jessica. I, I, that's right. I, he died. I'm glad he died for old man Klein. I'm glad he died, hallelujah, for old man Klein. I'm happy in my soul today because Jesus died for me. Hey, man, that makes you somebody right there. Amen. I'm telling you, uh, it, it wasn't Buddha. It wasn't Muhammad. It was not Allah. Get this through your head, people. All religions are not the same. They called on Jesus. Nobody else. There was probably another religious charlatan around there a time or two during that time. They didn't call on them. They didn't say, Allah, help us. They said, Jesus, help us. Somebody said one time they, they try to tell you on the news that all religions are the same. And this Islam stuff, brother, I mean, it's, it's coming in like a flood. Now, I don't hate nobody. God loves everybody. I ain't trying to be mean or nothing. But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. They didn't get healed till they called on him. And you ain't going to get help calling on Allah. Allah don't exist unless it's a devil. And I'm telling you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, they called on Jesus. They called on Jesus. I read about this druggist who was uh, helping this patient, and they, they were given a prescription, and the story was this. I give it to you like I read it. They put barium sulfate in his prescription, and it killed him. And instead, it was supposed to be in barium sulfite. And there's only one letter difference between sulfate and sulfite. F-A-T-E, F-I-T-E. And that one letter Made, the, made that medicine poison and killed the patient. And there's a lot of people say, well, well, all these other religions have so many things in common and they're all similar and don't, don't, I mean, really, don't them people in the other countries, if they, I mean, I mean, come on, God's good. I mean, ain't he up? Nope, nope. I mean, I didn't write it. I didn't make this thing. My job is to deliver you the mail. I put it in your box. And the mail said, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. There is no other way besides Him. It was a cry of, of a positive faith. Number three, it was a cry in opposition to the flesh. There was that opposition. There's people didn't want them yet. Matter of fact, now imagine this. You got these religious people. Lord, they had on their religious, Lord, they was all dressed up, them lights on their breasts, and they had the, the big 
big uh, long robes on and stuff on. They were the religious people of the day. I mean, you know, you could tell, but look at that. I like, I like what old, uh, old, old Ruckman told this guy one time uh, when his, a priest looked at him, and they said, why you wear all that garb and stuff like that? And he said, uh, well, my robe is the signification of my, my holiness. And he said, what, Jared? And he said, my face is mine. My face is mine. You can tell by a person's face whether they're right with God or not. Their countenance. And these guys looked around, they had on their big religious robes, trying to impress everybody how great they were, how wonderful they were. And two old blind men, they probably smelled bad. Their breath stank. They were over there, and they're saying, Jesus, have mercy on us. And they went over there and said, hush, hush, be quiet. You don't want to fool with people like you. Ah, get them out of here. Somebody get these people out of here. We're walking with Jesus. The multitude rebuked them. Now, I'm going to tell you something this morning. Now, some of you people ain't, might not like this, and I know people hear me all over the world on the Internet they ain't going to like it, but it's the truth anyway. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm just sick and tired of every time you see people, all they talk about is their, their job and their education and their money, and I'm this and this is so important. And I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to work, you've got to make a living. There ain't nothing wrong with education. But I'm telling you, the most important thing your child or my kids over there this morning could ever do is call on the Lord and get Jesus' attention. I, I got three daughters sitting over there this morning, and I would rather them know the Lord and know that they know who Jesus is and that He's working in their life than them to own everything in Burke County. And I mean that with all my heart. I seen somebody the other day, uh, and they were all talking to me. And they, you know how parents try to impress each other. Oh, where's your kid? Oh, uh, he's studying law now, and he's in his third year and getting his graduate degree. Well, where's your? Oh, oh well, they're in uh, UNC uh, Asheville, and they're, they're transferring to William, and they're going to state next year, and then they're going transferring to UNC. And I thought, you poor crazy people, is that all you think is important? You know, the, the most blessed parent in here this morning is one of me. Somebody tells me, say, I'm so proud of my daughter. She's 20 years old, and she goes to church every Sunday morning and Sunday night and serves God and even visits a bus route and lives for the Lord and tries to get people saved. Get your priorities right, brother. The multitude said, hush, hush, hush. You know what the Lord did? The Lord ignored them religious Pharisees and walked right over there and healed them two blind men. I'm not against education. Amen? I'm not against it. If it's biblical. Any education with that that's against the Bible is not education at all. It's wickedness. Education without salvation, damnation. That's what it is. And the most dangerous, wicked people in the world are educated, wicked people. Them people that carried out Hitler's orders were very intelligent, highly educated men. I'm telling you this morning, there was a cry in opposition to the flesh. They said this man, this Egyptian merchant, many, many years ago, out in the Sahara Desert, there's two big old stones stuck up. And they said uh, that there was a mar uh, it marked a place where a religious uh, uh, a merchant died of thirst. And a man paid $22,000 for a drink of water. Out there in the Sahara Desert, that's how thirsty he was. Equivalent to our $22,000 for a drink of water. And they said a thousand feet away was a well he could have got water out of. And they died and didn't realize it. And that's a picture of how many people in this world accomplish this, accomplish that, accomplish this, and accomplish that. And the Lord Jesus Christ right here, a thousand feet away. And they miss it. Wind up dying without God. Number four. It was a cry for rearranging of their natural condition. They didn't want a temporary relief. They didn't want a Band-Aid put on their eye. They didn't want somebody to come sit down and describe to them how beautiful trees was. They wanted transformation, new life, everything. We're asking for, listen, if he's God, he can do anything, right? You don't say, Lord, help me to be a better person. You say, Lord, I want a brand new life today. Now, there's somebody here this morning, you've never done that. 
You've never come to the Lord. You've never done... Listen, they, they, he wasn't ashamed to speak out boldly for it. They wanted everything. You can't cure a blind man by increasing the light. You can't just keep t putting a floodlight right in his face. Well, can you see now? That ain't going to do it. Uh, it's going to take a miracle. It took a miracle. It took a miracle to save me. It took a miracle to save you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, old George Mueller, you've heard me mention George Mueller. If you went to the right kind of school, you know about George Mueller. And George Mueller, when he was wicked, he was in s only 16 years old. And George Mueller, uh, he, he was wicked as a devil, got in trouble, got locked up in jail while in his college years. And when he was 20 years old, he came under the influence of the Bible, got under conviction, and got saved. George Mueller. He wound up praying in tens of thousands of dollars uh, for those orphans, read the Bible through 200 times, and preached for many, 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 many years. And he died. He, they said he gave away $135,000. That's like a million now. And he gave away $135,000 and died with just a few thousand dollars to his name and went home to heaven. Brother, that man went from a guy getting drunk, getting locked up, to a preacher in glory shouting the victory. He had a transformation. I'm telling you, I didn't get I didn't get turned over a new leaf. I got saved. I got saved. I hope you did too. It's not it's not it's not just uh, turning over a new leaf. It's not a reformation, it's regeneration. That's why the Lord said you gotta be born again. Finally, I'll say this, number five. It's a cry that was rewarded by the Savior. He stopped what he was doing. Here's Jesus walking. Thousands of people hollering and screaming. He stopped. Everybody stopped and said, why did he stop? Why did he stop? He turned around. He said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he went right over there and bent down where them two blind men was. Walk right, right past them people that thought this so good. Let me tell you how to get help from the Lord. The way to get help from the Lord is humble yourself. The Bible don't say you have to come up here and get down on your knees. The Bible don't say that. But you know why we do it? It's a good sign you're willing to humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need help. And Lord, the only way I can... Listen, it, there's just something about humbling yourself. You don't get God's attention by your talent. You don't get God's attention by your education. You don't get God's attention by your money. You get God's attention when you humble yourself. It's a cry that stopped the Savior. Anybody in here need help? I'll tell you how to get it. Come down off your high horse. Be willing to get down on your knees. I appreciate men in our church that's willing to walk down here and pray. That's a good sign. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign you've got a brain in your head. Jesus wasn't weak. I appreciate ladies in here. I said, oh, there's no way I'm not going down there. Oh, with those breast-beating fanatics. Well, the Lord will never help you then. There ain't no hope for you. There ain't no hope for you unless you humble yourself. Let them old boys said, hey, we ain't got nothing to be proud of. We're just two old blind men. Jesus, Jesus, help us, Jesus. And they got the Lord's attention. Amen. He stopped and heard their cry. He helped them instantly. One touch of God can do what jail can't do, what rehab can't do, uh, what counseling can't do, what uh, 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 jail time can't do, prison time. One touch of God can do it. Listen, God can touch a man and him drunk. I've seen it happen over and over and over. Sober him up just like that. I mean, it's better than a hundred cups of coffee. Getting one touch of the Lord, bam, buddy. I mean, you're as sober as a judge. I led this boy to the Lord one time, four o'clock in the morning. He's drunk, been out drunk all night, and uh, I, I led him to the Lord. He got saved, and then I rode him around town, saying, "You want some coffee? Yeah. You want more? Yeah, yeah." I fed him about five cups of coffee. I said, "You mean business?" He said, "Yeah." I took him home at 4 o'clock in the morning and knocked on the door, and his wife come to the door at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I said, uh, I, he said, can I come in? And she turned around and said, you can do what you want to. And, uh, he had been, and uh, I said, now, I'll come back and get you here. You be ready. I'm going to church this morning. And I thought, I mean, out drunk all night long. I went home and slept about an hour, got ready for church, come back and knocked on the door, and he come out ready to go to church. Been going ever since. And I'm telling you this morning, there ain't a rehab program in the world can do that. That's been over 30 years ago. I mean, jail time can't do that. 
AA can't do that. I mean, sometimes them things can do some good. I'm talking about total transformation, brother. I'm talking about regeneration. I'm talking about getting born again. It'll make a difference. Years ago, there was an old colonel in the army in Virginia named Colonel Byrd, and he was captured by the Cherokee Indians, and they held him captive for a while, and finally they was going to kill him. And it just so happens he had made friends with one of the Indians who was the chief, had been the chief of the tribe, been his friend. And it come execution time. And they went and got him. They said, all right, bud, time for you to die. And they took Colonel Boyd out, and they got ready to kill him like that. And that Indian friend of his come and threw himself over him like that and said, if you kill him, you got to kill me first. And they spared his life. I tell you, I read that and I about shouted. I said, one time the devil had me on the chocolate block, y'all. And he's going to take me to hell. And right about that time, and I deserved it. And I was on enemy territory. Thank God there's one that loved me enough, put it out his hand like that and said, Look, wait a minute, if you kill him, you got to kill me first. And Jesus took my place. And my cry stopped the Savior. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it that night I got saved. Oh, he, could have, he didn't have to listen to me, but I'm glad my cry stopped the Savior. You may be here this morning you say, Preacher, God's awful busy. Do you really think He would hear me? Yeah. Yeah, He would hear you. He'd hear you this morning. You're just as important to Him as anybody else in the whole world. All you have to do Say, Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. Your heart, it's a it's condition of your heart. It's not the words of your mouth. It's a condition of your heart that gets God's attention. Oh, I'm glad of that. I'm glad you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. I'm glad you don't have to know the catechism and all the different religious things people come up with. It's just, Lord, I need help. And your cry can stop the Savior. Right now, he is keeping the planets in line. What's holding the world out here? Space. I mean, think about it. Well, gravitation. Well, what, what in the world is that? He's running the universe right now. And there's almost 7 billion people on this planet. And he can come to the shining light Baptist church and hear you. That's Jesus. Let's stand. Let's stand and bow our heads in prayer, please. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. These two men made a cry.